It was about a month or so before Christmas, 2001. We just hit the wall and went to China to ride a boat, buy a rug, whack a nose, ring a bell, see a secret warrior, see a bear, meet a discoverer, get a Chinese name, go to an opera, buy a pot, climb a wall, and have a fascinating 10 days in the ancient and the new China. Within about 12 hours, we flew from Detroit over Alaska, over Russia, had a stop over in Tokyo, then it was on to Shanghai. Anticipating the trip, one wonders, will we visit a Life magazine picture of a communist country full of poor people in Mao jackets? What we see, however, are indicators of a strong movement from a socialist dogma to a powerful economic reform that has been progressing rapidly for at least the last 10 years. Our 10-day visit included a three-day stay in each of three cities, Shanghai, Xi'an, and Beijing, the capital of China, each day we traveled in a comfortable new tour bus. Within each city we had an English-speaking Chinese guide, employees of the Chinese Tour Bureau. They were experts on China and the history of the host city. The day would begin with an attractive hotel breakfast suited to both Eastern and Western tastes. In Shanghai, we also have custom omelets. At lunch in Xi'an, we find a champion noodle maker. Now each fold doubles the number of noodles. And here's how noodles are portioned if you only have chopsticks as tools. A very popular Chinese food is steamed dumplings. Each little dumpling was shaped to suggest the filling and we finish the meal with a flaming soup presentation. Now the weather was overcast and rainy during our first day in Shanghai, but we still had the opportunity to see remarkable construction in the city of 16 million. Within the last 10 years, they have built more than 3,500 apartment buildings higher than 10 stories. And people from all over China have been moving to such cities as Shanghai because of job growth and changes in government policies. In November 2001, there were more than 6,000 construction projects underway. This riverfront area, known as the Bund, is a show of contrast buildings from the 20s and 30s directly across the river from what looks to be buildings of the future, and several are hotels designed to attract conventions. Sure seemed like a great place for architects to flex their imaginations. The shape of the Shanghai Museum building follows an ancient Chinese thought that the earth is square and the heavens are round. Of the many galleries, one full wing is devoted to what they call their minorities, which is 5% of the population. And our guide says taking care of them means fewer problems. Outside the museum, a college buddy and I come up against a very pushy art director. Let's go, boys, anytime now. While in Shanghai, we visit a segment of the ancient Grand Canal. Now this is part of a system of canals which make up the Grand Canal. With 24 locks and 60 bridges, it is the oldest, longest canal in the world. Begun in 486 BC and continued through the 5th century AD, it is 1100 miles long, surpassing both the Suez and the Panama canals combined. People continue to live along this area of the canal, in which dwellings are anywhere from 100 to 400 years old, and some even live on their commercial boats. 
Now with most rivers in China running west to east, this north to south canal connecting the Yangtze River Valley to the Yellow River Valley improved commerce and enhanced the ability to defend the country. I've always said, anytime you get a chance to learn more about how things are done, pull over. Wait a minute, wait a minute! This isn't the ancient part of the craft. This is the ancient part of the story. The silkworm eats mulberry leaves and spins a silk filament cocoon. The cocoons are harvested from farms across the country and sold to the silk mills. Some cocoons are made entirely of one continuous unbroken silk filament about 4,500 feet long. And here's the trick of finding the end of that filament. Many filaments are combined to make a thread, and many threads are combined to make a yarn. When a moth is allowed to emerge from the cocoon, the continuous filament is broken. No longer a single thread, it is rather more of a net. So it is stretched and dried. Many of these are stretched over one another and arranged into resilient bundles, which are stretched into quilt filling. It's a technique not learned quickly nor easily. Dyed yarns also go to other factories to make what could be called the ultimate paint-by-number product, a silk rug. Each rug is made by knotting yarns, hundreds of knots per inch woven according to a number drawing. Segments are numbered according to pattern and color. One woman makes one complete rug. This fellow is giving more dimension to a pattern. Although a number of women are at work in this factory, this is more of a cottage industry. You'll find no machines making rugs in China. From this great selection, we chose one for ourselves. Now one woman worked five months in about 187,000 million bazillion silkworms gave it up for this beauty. The symbol is double happiness. The five bats symbolize the five blessings virtue, health, wealth, natural death, and long life. Wow! That price comes out to be about 30,000 US. Such pieces called cloisonne begin with a shape spun or cast in copper or brass. A pattern begins with wire frames fastened in place to hold a paste of fine glass frit or ceramic powder. This color paste is dabbed or painted into patterns or scenes. The work is fired at high temperatures, causing the frit or ceramic powder to melt into a hard glassy surface. The wire frames and the uneven surface is ground smooth and eventually polished to a hard, glass-like finish. We go back to silk to see the ultimate test of patience. These lovely pieces are created by hand on fine silk fabrics. Some shapes have a picture on one side and another on the back. Now if you thought grandma was good at embroidery, you haven't seen anything until you see this. It's one woman per picture, from start to finish, who stitches silk thread over silk thread for weeks or months on end, depending upon the complexity of the picture. So to finish the piece like this one, it's need to use about uh, 200 different colors. They need to do the layer after layers and amassing the many of colors together. And this gray is a special order from the Japanese. They just a picture.
Only young women with a certain talent are chosen for the six-year embroidery training program, which begins with learning first how to draw and paint. This commission picture will require more than six months of this girl's time and will sell for about $4,500 U.S. A visit to the jade carvers teaches us much about the quality of the stone varieties. This young woman, well versed in the gemstone art, is our guide and the key jade salesperson assigned to our group. This very hard gemstone is cut and polished with diamond charged tools. The culture in China is be smart, work hard, and don't be lazy. There's no welfare. An unskilled laborer will earn about 30 to 40 dollars U.S. per month. An office worker may earn anywhere from 100 to 5,000 dollars U.S. per month. A doctor or stockbroker may earn about 8,000 per month. And many people have two jobs, a government job and a job in private business. Men must retire at age 60 and women at age 55. A typical apartment, or as we know, condominium, will range in size from about 860 to 1100 square feet and cost about $40 US per square foot. Outside the city, an apartment may cost about $22 per square foot. Note the outside mounted air conditioning units and the laundry drying outside. Not much room inside. Subways, buses, taxis, and bicycles are so inexpensive that few people own private automobiles. Most everything from grandmas, wives, and children is moved by bicycle, including building materials and products. Now, most cars are Chinese, since any imported auto can have an import duty of 100%. Further, in Beijing at least, there is no used car market. Our guide says auto owners are considered to be very stupid, are very wealthy. We visited grade school in each of our three cities. Classes in the English language is a requirement for those over 10 years old, but even in kindergarten they are exposed to common English words. Because almost everyone in the family is working, it is common for youngsters to live at school through the week returning home only on weekends. The kids were very friendly as you can see and seemed to relish visits with Westerners, often inviting us to sing a dance. This may have been the biggest surprise of the tour. We would visit a Buddhist temple today, we knew that. So our bus parked at the curb near the street front building which I thought had all the appearance of a Chinese restaurant. Beyond the big red doors, though, we found this amazing setting. A huge temple, beautiful gardens, great golden Buddha figures, and a solemn ceremony performed by real live monks. The ceremony was for a deceased family member of those we see here dressed in black. High thresholds were intended to inhibit the movement of evil spirits. Evil spirits, it was thought, could travel only in straight lines. You may be surprised to know that this is known as the Temple of the Reclining Buddha. That figure is carved from one piece of jade. China is officially atheist, however, Buddhism remains popular with many people. Incense carries the prayers heavenward. Well, I guess you'll never know what you find behind the doors of a Chinese restaurant. Of all the things to do in China, one thing is to be sure to see things unique to China. And this may be the most famous of all, the giant pandas at the zoo in Beijing. 
This was the very home of the pandas we now have at our National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Such unusual creatures call to mind theme park characters. Is this what a giant panda really looks like? Or is that a person inside a furry suit? The state still owns all the land and most of the businesses, but there are changes. McDonald's flourishes, and this KFC was opened November 2001. The Chinese arts are so beautiful that one feels compelled to bring home samples of everything. Here, Moon Wood is written in Chinese characters. And Shirley's name is illustrated in a fanciful English character styling. Art is stamped with the artist and often the owner's symbol. That stamp or symbol is called a chop. And the stamp is carved from a soft stone. Each city we visit has new museum buildings with thousands of artifacts displaying their culture and history. These are tourist and money magnets and new business ventures considering this country was not very open to tourists until about 20 years ago. And what else is Chinese? Acrobats and theater. We were offered optional evening shows. We took all the options. Just as they do for their athletes, the Chinese government sponsors the training for these talented entertainers. Along with plate spinners, magicians, teeterboard acrobats and such, there were these remarkable acts. all with one foot on a rolling balance pad. Every time I watch this act, I am surprised he pulls it off without injury. I still can't believe what I'm seeing. What we see and hear in Shanghai was what the emperors were treated to centuries ago. Costumes and instruments, of course, are traditional. The evening show in Beijing was the world-famous opera. Known incorrectly as the Peking Opera, it is the Beijing Opera. This female character is in search of her scholar boyfriend. Traditionally, the male actors played all the parts and the story would go for six hours or so. Not that long for us, though. Subtitles help us follow the story. This Garden of the Summer Palace is the largest, best-preserved royal garden in China and covers an area of more than one square mile. This garden has a history spanning 800 years, though most of what we see today was built or restored in the early 1900s. Restoration continues today.
These paintings tell the story of the Summer Palace. What was once nothing more than a small stream was made into this lake by the Emperor Qianlong in 1750. The earth from the lake was used to create the hill for this building and he named it Longevity Hill to celebrate his mother's birthday. The last emperor was driven out in 1924 and the garden was turned into a park for the Beijing citizens to relax and to escape the summer heat. Now today it's hard to imagine how a populace could have been enslaved to satisfy the whim of a single emperor. Midway through our trip, we take a one and a half hour flight to Xi'an, the first capital of China, and the home of the first emperor. Chen Shi Huang was a cruel ruler who subjugated and consolidated the warring states into one empire, but he also standardized the written language, the weights, and measures, and from his name came the name of the country. These enormous statues outside the glass walls of our hotel suggest the great emperor Qin is still in charge. Along the way to the terracotta warriors are these hills. Actually, they're tombs of other emperors. And this building will become a welcome center once the tomb behind is excavated. This huge museum complex covers an area of more than eight acres. Because the artifacts were buried here, it is that rare condition where the museum is brought to the artifacts. Now, Qin's rule began in 220 BC. He wanted to live and rule forever, so he had an elaborate tomb built, complete with bronze figures to carry and protect him in the afterlife. Not content with the security of a tomb, he also had a great army constructed and hid underground nearby. Set in columns 15 to 20 feet underground, the army was covered by timbers, fiber mats, earth, and finally hidden under plowed earth. A film dramatization shows how, some years after Chin's death, the underground army was raided by a group led by one of the 17 sons. Terracotta figures were destroyed, and the roofing timbers were set ablaze. All remained hidden until 1974. Peasants digging wells discovered what they thought was pottery. Soon afterward, archaeologists began a long process of restoration, and it continues today. Piece by piece, the warriors are reassembled and set into place atop tiles, just as they had been positioned more than 2,200 years ago. He wanted to show the real army because he was the first emperor of China and so all his army they coming from different areas from all part of China so everybody they look different. Even today and from the faces we could tell where did those uh, soldiers the men come from. Some are really standing in tall men. Clothing styles vary somewhat according to a warrior's home province and each may have been sculpted from living figures since each face is unique, not one face is identical to the other. Although the mausoleum was labored over by more than 100,000 workers for 35 years, these figures carry the mark of any one of only 80 sculptors. The dark ashes are the remains of roof timbers. Another area still under excavation is this pit where the army's commanders were discovered. In total, within this whole eight-acre area, there are more than 8,000 figures. It was our good fortune to meet and greet Mr. Yang Yun Peng, 
the first discoverer. He is illiterate, but he autographed and stamped his chop in the latest Terracotta Warrior book. Xi'an was the first walled imperial city. Constructed first with pounded earth, then in the 14th century, covered with brick and stone. The ancient city was completely surrounded by this wall, several stories high and 30 feet wide at the top. To walk the circumference, you will walk 14 miles. The city wall was protected by a moat all the way around. A glimpse at the new construction suggested China was no sissy place for workers and safety measures are few. Can you believe this guy? Only in more modern times has there been much thought to recreation and relaxation for citizens. This pagoda was used for storing sacred documents and for religious education. This is uh, the pagoda, that's the original one. It was uh, stand like 1300 years. For a small donation, one can ring an ancient 10 ton iron bell. Yeah, he's okay. Over here. Everybody wants to be a director. Su, a native of Xi'an, explains attitudes toward religion today in China, which officially is atheist. And this is a time the Buddhist religion was a major religion. So the Buddhism were, they believe the next life. They more believe the next life. What they believe is your life could be a kind of circling. When you die, only your body is dead. You should have another kind of birth. So you have to behave yourself very good. Otherwise, your next life could become a fly. You could become something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you control yourself, you behave yourself, which is really good during a lifetime, your next life could become, uh, you could become an emperor, you could become a... Uh, uh, and so that's why we have more people believe the Buddhism religion rather than our local religion, Taoism. And at night in the city, it is show business. Food preference is a product of one's culture. There are 4,500 animal species on Earth. 16 are used for food. There are 500,000 plant species on Earth. 30 of these provide us with 85% of our food. Since even our guide said, Chinese eat anything with four legs except the table and chairs they are sitting on. So we opted for a trip to the Beijing Fresh Food Market. Now this is the market where homemakers and restaurant buyers shop for the day's needs. You may buy the whole chicken, or duck, or just the feet. Now the feet are good for skin, our guide said. From roast piglet to roast duck, complete with heads. Need a soft shell turtle? Could you find fresher eel? Crab or crab legs, perhaps? They had snake this day also. And it is 
always very fresh. Curbside snacks are handy, but we'll wait until a little later for ours, though. Thank you. Perhaps the most exciting and famous of our three cities is Beijing. Anticipating this great wall was very exciting, and we were each bound to a window. The scale was truly astonishing, and here it was right beside our roadway. Of the several gateways to the Great Wall, we visit Badaling, which is northwest of Beijing, and the one most used for dignitaries. Approaching Badaling, curiosity becomes wonder. The wall snakes across mountaintop to mountaintop, and directly ahead are the ruins of a wall section. How could anything have been built on such rugged and severe terrain by manual labor more than 500 years ago? Now what we know as the Great Wall was initially many defensive walls built during the 4th and 5th centuries BC. It was during this Warring States period that the Chinese began building defensive walls in earnest. The state of Qi built a wall along its southern border to keep out the armies of Chu. Chu built a northern barrier to protect themselves against Qin. And the states of Qin, Yen, and Chao built walls to keep out northern barbarians and each other. In all, some 2,800 miles of walls were built along the frontiers of the various fighting states. The Emperor Qin unified China in 220 BC and demanded that all walls be joined as protection against northern nomads. The walls we visit were begun during the Ming Dynasty in the year 1505. Our guide, Wong, bids us adieu as we begin our climb up to the wall. And our goal, says Shirley, is that tower at the top. Of all the tourists here today, very few were Westerners. These battle forts were built two arrow shots apart. They were garrisons as well as storage for weapons and ammunition. Now there are various estimates as to the length of all the combined sections of the wall but a figure of 3,700 miles seems to be most prevalent. Portions of the walls were restored in the 1800s and also in the 1980s. Still, the wear on some stones brings a wonder as to how many footprints have passed over these very stones in all these past centuries. Such side towers were used for storage and as supports for smoke and fire signals. And even the shooting ports were decorated. This stairwell leads to ground level and another marketing opportunity. Having your picture taken on a camel or having your picture taken dressed as the Emperor. Construction labor for these walls came mostly from the army and was augmented by captured enemies and conscripts from the citizenry. There were 200 crimes punishable by labor on the wall and punishment included life sentences and perpetual sentences. And many may have prayed for life sentences because a perpetual sentence meant when you died or could no longer work, next of kin would replace you. When all of your kin were gone, a neighbor or your closest friend would serve your sentence. It was a climb of 45 minutes, and now it's time to return to Bada Ling, way down there. Aside from the long, hard climb, being a top what is said to be the only man-made object identifiable from the moon was truly exhilarating. This was once a symbol of oppression to the Chinese and many referred to it as the world's longest cemetery. For every ten laborers recruited only three would live and anyone found napping on the wall would be buried within. 
Now in modern times, the Great Wall is a monument proudly displayed as a symbol of China's greatness and is celebrated each year by millions of visitors. The Great Wall has also seen many world leaders in the 70s, the 80s, 90s, and several celebrities walk the wall in November 2001. A special side trip takes us into a classic housing area known as a hutong. Here we are in our pedicab. <laughs> Built in quadrangles, this is the arrangement the palace kinsmen had in the 14th century. About half the population of Beijing lives in such surroundings today. And we stop in for tea and cookies with a family of three. He is a retired engineer, she a retired school teacher, and their adult son is a dentist. This home was owned by his grandparents, and he's lived here for 55 years. He looks to locate our homes in America. You notice that the United States is not the center of their map. We're invited to tour this 400-year-old structure. The bedroom, the kitchen, and the bathroom, which you see is not too westernized. The hot water heating system is fired by this outside boiler. A very cold night will cost them about 12 compressed cakes of charcoal. The quadrangle courtyard is multi-purpose. In the center of Beijing is the Forbidden City, which covers an area of 178 acres. China was ruled from here by 24 emperors over a period of 500 years. And more than a million workers and 100,000 artisans were driven into long-term hard labor in the construction of this city, which began in the year 1407 and was completed 14 years later. Huge flooring stones were quarried from a Beijing suburb. During the winter, the stones would be dragged to the city over roads made icy by water from wells, which were dug every 1,500 feet. This feels so eerie, peering through windows into the very living quarters once used by godlike emperors, seeing the beds and the very objects only they could touch, knowing no one ever again will inhabit these spaces. The Hall of Supreme Harmony is where the Emperor ascended the throne to make important decisions, grant formal interviews to celebrities, and celebrate important events. This is where the last Emperor, the Child Emperor, would sit. His mother, hidden from view by the screen behind him, would coach him through his official oh, yeah, duties. So that's the curtain? Yeah. This grand square is where the military would gather for celebrations and the prisoners and spoils of war would be presented. Huge two-ton vats of iron or bronze stored water for firefighting. More than 300 protected the city, and many were gilded with gold originally. This huge marble sculpture is the largest sculpture in the Forbidden City. Weighing 250 tons, it took 20,000 men 30 days to move it some 40 miles. Once in place, only the emperor could touch it. Any other would be put to death. Directly across the boulevard from the Forbidden City is the famous Tiananmen Square. Today, citizens are flying kites and enjoying a day of leisure. The boulevard between the Forbidden City and the square is where the famous standoff between the young student and the tank took place, June 1989. The press reported that anywhere from 500 to 3,000 students were massacred here during a protest against the government. 
However, another accounting of the event claims that fewer than 100 died in their attempt to block soldiers from the square, and the allegations of massacre came from an overzealous press. And here we see a Western woman modeling the latest in baseball hats. China may have a long way to go with regard to social and economic reform, but what country could match this magnificent architecture and the country's poetic beauty?